Hello, ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome to the Heisenbach uh, uh, Autumn. Yes, we have autumn, we have early morning in St. Petersburg. And today, our first talk, uh, Warehouse Automation Testing from Mesut Drukal. Let me introduce um, Mesut has uh, 13 years experience in industrial automation, IoT platforms, SaaS, PaaS, uh, cloud services, etc., etc., etc. Uh, he's a real specialist uh, in uh, robots, uh, has so several projects like monitoring and bug management uh, with machine learning, uh, and several awards like USAT 8 Best Presentation Award. Also, Mesut has uh, a lot of talks, so uh, I will glad to, to talk with you. Yep, Mesut. So, uh, hi, how are you? Hey, Avanir. Thanks for the great introduction. It's uh, great to be here. Okay, so where are you now? I'm in Yokohama, Japan. It is very close to Tokyo. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you you don't have early morning, as I understand. You have something like afternoon, right? Yes, that's correct. It is 4.20 now. 4.15, yeah. Uh, Okay, great. So, uh, good luck. Uh, let's start your talk. Thanks a lot. Okay. Let's ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Just a moment, uh, guys. You can um, send your questions uh, um, to our messenger or in chat um, under the talk. Yes. Okay, please. so let's start. Okay. Cool. So, hello, everyone, again. Uh, great things to all the audience. Uh, again, I'm very happy to be here and to be a part of this amazing conference. My name is Misut Turukal and I'm originally from Turkey, but now I'm based in Japan, as we just discussed. And I'm a quality assurance engineer and I have 13 years experience. And mostly I'm doing test automation as the other QA engineers, because, you know, nowadays most of the uh, QA engineers or the test engineers are doing test automation. Test automation is an important part of the quality assurance nowadays because we are doing the continuous testing with only manual activities. It is really not easy to cover all the activities. So I'm doing mostly test automation. And in one of my recent projects, I had the chance to test the warehouse automation system. I believe it is a very trending topic because most of the big companies are investing on this. So what is a warehouse automation system? There are some AMRs which are namely autonomous mobile robots operating in the warehouses, and they are supporting and assisting the human operators. So we install lots of different robots. Robots are moving around in the warehouse, and they are assisting the picking operations. So in the warehouse, there are lots of different items to be collected after the orders arrived, and these robots are helping human operators to uh, assist the operation. So uh, I left some uh, socials on the slide, so feel free to get connected. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments, just don't hesitate to reach out to me. Okay, so this is the brief agenda for the talk. Uh, we will start by an introduction of the system under test. So I will describe how the whole system looks like, and I will introduce the components of the system. And then I will share some test activities, what kind of test activities we are doing. And then most, maybe the most important part, the challenges, the problems that we have. Of course, if I'm talking about problems, I'm supposed to talk about solutions as well. So I will share some solutions along with the problems. And finally, we will wrap up uh, by going over what kind of difficulties, challenges we went through, and what kind of proposals I shared to you. And uh, I will finish by a call uh, for action. So. Let's get started with the system under test. So the warehouse automation is look like, looks like this. So there are lots of different robots. First of all, waiting in idle station. So they are in the charging position. First of all, they are uh, connected to the charging modules. And then if they are called by the system to go to certain locations, they start moving. They leave the charging uh, station, and then they start moving in the uh, aisles of the warehouse. So in the warehouse, there are lots of different racks. 
on the racks we see lots of different items and in the aisles in the corridors of the uh, warehouse we can see the robots are moving of course we will see some human operators as well and uh, of course in the system uh, one of the most uh, important component is the amr itself the robots so we can see on the robots there are some containers in this one for example we can see two folded containers these containers we call it as tote so we place the tote itself, and then when the operator pick the items, they place the item on this container. In this way, they don't have to carry by themselves because sometimes they have to move and carry heavy items. But in this way, they just place on the robot, and robot is already moving with the items collected from the shelves. And uh, what else? We can see a screen on the robot on top, and we can so, uh, see two uh, red buttons, one on the top, and one on the bottom. What are these re red buttons? These are the uh, emergency stop buttons. If something unexpected happens, if we want robot to suddenly stop, because maybe there are some human in front of the robot, we don't want robot to crash in the human beings. So uh, sometimes, normally the system uh, is supposed to stop the robot in such cases, but if any unexpected situation happens, then we may trigger this uh, emergency uh, stop buttons. And there are lots of different sensors on the robot. And uh, yeah, the, uh, on the screen, we will see already the uh, robot UI software. So this robot UI software is the next thing that we will uh, go through. This, uh, on this uh, UI, we can see lots of different interactions. So whenever the human operators pick the items, then they should let the system know that the item is already picked, right? So this is done on the screen. When the human operator is done with the current picking, then he can click on the relevant buttons and let the robot go to the next location. So in this way, the human operator uh, says that the current uh, picking from the current location is done. So uh, I'm done by clicking the button. And then uh, it is saying robot that it can go to the next location. And not only the interactions, but also some instructions there are on the screen. For example, when the human operator picks the relevant item, then uh, which should be the next location? After picking the current item, where should he or she should move? So this next location, he or she, the human operator can understand by reading the instructions from the uh, screen, from the robot UI. So this robot UI is a part of the software which can be executed on any operating system. So we just install on the robot, so uh, as we can uh, do in any PC as well. So it is just running as a UI application, as a web application. So uh, the uh, operator commands are collected from this UI, or the instruct, uh, instructions are shown to the operators on this uh, UI. Next, we have the IMS, which is mainly the inventory management system. What is the inventory management system? Uh, we can manage all the items. For example, there are lots of different items in the warehouse, and they all have some unique IDs. When I pick one of them, uh, I have to update the status that this item is picked. But how can I update the status? I can uh, send some requests to the system, but of course, I should pass this unique ID. So this IMS has some open APIs, some uh, endpoints. So in this way, by calling some request, API requests, I can read the status, like I can read the ID of the item or even the dimensions, right? Each uh, item has some different dimensions. So in this way, I can understand which item I can place on the top. Sometimes the items are really very big. They don't fit into the container. So maybe I should change uh, the container that I'm using. Or otherwise, if I can fit more than one, maybe I can place uh, multiple items on the container. So this kind of reading operations I can do by sending uh, the uh, get comments to the APIs, or if I want to update the status, I can uh, send some update put or patch comments to the APIs. All these kind of things we will do in test automation. For example, when I want to simulate the scenarios on the robot UI, I will install this web application on any PC and I will execute my test cases. And similarly, when I want to do the API testing, I will send some queries to the IMS to read the uh, items, 
or update the status of the items. What else? We have the HPC. What is HPC? When in a warehouse everything is installed, then uh, in warehouses there is not only one robot, but there are lots of different robots, right? Maybe we are installing five different robots in a warehouse, depending on the size of the warehouse. Sometimes we need five of them, sometimes we need 10 of them. So we may have different numbers of robots installed in the warehouse. So how can we manage all of them? Because robots should know where each other are. If any other robot is already going to a specific location, the other robot doesn't have to go to that location because otherwise there will be congestion. In warehouse automation systems, congestion is a big problem. If there's a traffic in some aisles, robots are blocking each other. One is just standing on the path and the others cannot move through that aisle because of the uh, waiting robot, because of uh, uh, they, they are blocked uh, because of another robot, then it is a big problem. So we want a, a fluent flow. All the robots can move easily without waiting for the others. So to be able to achieve this, they should be managed and orchestrated from a central PC. This is what we call as HPC. So in each warehouse, there is one PC managing all the robots. This PC knows each uh, robot's location and uh, sends comments to each robot. When the order, a new order arrives to the warehouse, like, uh, by the way, we are talking about orders, but what an order is, like, for example, uh, we should deliver 10 different items to a specific client or customer, right? This is we call as an order containing some uh, items to be delivered to a specific customer. So when a new order comes to the warehouse, then the robots should pick these items for uh, to make them uh, ready for the delivery. So to manage this order, the uh, HPC divides or splits the order into different uh, legs and assigns each leg to a different robot. So in this way, we can uh, divide the whole responsibility into lots of different robots and we can uh, increase the efficiency because otherwise uh, we don't have to use only one robot. We already have lots of different robots, so why not uh, assign all of them in action? So this is HPC is doing the orchestration and management of multiple robots. And uh, we can see as on this slide, there are lots of different charts showing the status of the robots. For example, some of them are charging. Some of them are collecting the items. Some of them are uh, already may maybe unloading the totes. So there are lots of different status. And for the orders as well, some of the orders are completed. Some of them are waiting. Some of them are in progress. So we can see all the distribution on lots of different charts uh, shown on the HPC. So HPC has another uh, web application. Uh, we have one application on the robot. We can see on the screens on robot. And we have another web application, which we can see on the HPC. So these two UIs uh, are uh, the components of the system. And uh, not only the Edge, but also we have the cloud platform as well. Why? Because we don't have only one warehouse. We have lots of different warehouses. So for example, we have lots of different clients and customers buying this uh, service or the uh, product. and each warehouse have different configuration. For example, one when warehouse uh, is using the last version of the robots, but maybe some of them are using the previous version. So we can manage these warehouses from remote, from the cloud platform, because sometimes we are fixing the bugs, right? We are releasing the bug fixes, or we are releasing just new features in the new versions. So what will we do to update the robot used in the warehouses? Some of the warehouses are, for example, our office in Tokyo, and one warehouse is in Hokkaido. It is uh, five hours uh, distant from uh, our uh, company, our office. What will we do? Should we have to, uh, or should we go to the specific client? No, we are just using the cloud platform. We are installing the new version over the cloud platform, and in this way, we are managing all the versions and uh, warehouse configurations. So this is the uh, general overlook of the whole system. In the slide, we can see on the top uh, of the slide, the system under test with different components, the robot UI, the HPC, and the IMS with the open API endpoints. 
And on the bottom layer, we can see the system, uh, system testing framework. So we have lots of different test automation frameworks and libraries. Mainly we are using Python language for automating our test cases. But of course, for uh, the test framework, the main test framework, we are using PyTest. And to perform our API and UI testing activities, we use Selenium and request libraries and lots of different modules for doing some uh, test automation activities. I will show some test code as well to make you better understand how it looks like. But first of all, let me share our testing environment. Because normally we have lots of different test activities. For example, first of all, we have the in-house testing activities, and then we are going to the customer environment itself, the real production environment, and then we are doing the testing uh, steps over there. But first of all, if we just directly go to the uh, production environment, and if we have any trivial errors or bugs, then it would be not a very efficient way. We could already block them if we already uh, are aware of these bugs. So what do we do? First of all, before going to the client side, before going to the production environment, first of all, we are testing uh, our product in our testing facilities. So we call it alpha testing. Before going to production, first of all, do the, all the testing activities in-house environments. And then we go to the customer sites, we do the beta testing activities, and then eventually we do the uh, system acceptance testing with the attendance of the clients themselves. To, uh, we uh, explain all the use cases and we get some feedback from them, how satisfied they are with the current implementation or the design, if or if they have any additional requests, or if some of the features they are not satisfied, we are uh, understanding their situation in our uh, system acceptance testing activities. And this is one example scenario, uh, including the test code. So uh, this is uh, nothing but uh, just performing some steps. First of all, we, order, uh, we clean all the previous orders to start from scratch, and then we place an order. Just we uh, are calling the uh, one endpoint of the IMS, we place an order, and then what should we do? First, when the order arrives, the robot should move. So the first action is placing some tote on the robot, which we call as loading. And then after the tote is loaded, the container is loaded, we pick the items, and then finally we go to the unloading spot and we unload the tote uh, or the containers. So this is the ordinary flow. So in this test, I cover this flow with some uh, assertions. The expected behaviors are checked and asserted by the reference values, by the expected values. So for example, just after I load the thought, I did not pick any item yet. So my expected results here, it is a little bit small, but I hope it is readable. So uh, first of all, the unloaded situation is marked as not completed because I just load the thought and I didn't place any item yet. And the values or the information that I read from IMS should match with the information I read from the uh, HPC. All these components should be in sync. For example, I read the status from the IMS and then from the HPC and then from the robot screen as well. So if any of this information is inconsistent with the other one, then it means that the system is not working properly. So all these modules and components should have good interactions and uh, integrations and should uh, perform a good communication. Whenever I do some interactions on the robot UI, the robot UI send, uh, send, should send the updated information to the HPC. And HPC should inform a IMS that the order is updated or the item is updated. So all these kind of interactions uh, we are testing uh, and we are trying to cover by our test cases. So let's a little bit start discussing the uh, difficulties or the challenges that we encounter. First of all, let's start by the main purpose of this system. Why are we developing this system? What is the main purpose? The main purpose is improving the efficiency. Because if we don't have this system in place, Normally, what is the other scenario, uh, the other way around? Uh, normally, only the human operators would pick the items. So what is the disadvantage or the drawback of this system? First of all, human operators are walking a lot. 
They are getting tired. They are human. They are not robots. And they are carrying the items. Sometimes they are heavy. So what we want to do is to minimize this walking distance. If somehow we utilize robots, maybe robots can already optimize the path which should be traveled. So in short, this is a minimum traveling salesman problem, which is very well known in the software architecture and the software design literature. So the, when there are lots of different items to be collected in lots of different locations, we should visit all the spots, right, to collect the items. But eventually, the total distance to collect these items should be minimum. If I first go to the far, uh, farthest place and then come back all the way around uh, to the uh, starting point and then again going to a very far away, then it is not efficient. But I should collect all the items in a way they are all uh, uh, in very close to each other. I should select the optimum path. I should optimize this. So this is our problem. So let's, let's now think about this. How can I verify or validate this? How can I test? How can I ensure that the algorithm, algorithm is working correctly? So normally, this is a very difficult problem. This, is, uh, this can be ensured or verified with some mathematical uh, algorithms. But what we do uh, or what we have done in our testing activity is, first of all, we define some uh, performance metrics. For example, the, as the purpose uh, implies, the minimum distance or uh, the actual distance traveled by the human operators or the robots is one metric. So if we track this metric and if we realize that after installing the robot, really human operators start to walk uh, in smaller distances. If we realize this, we can already understand that the system is uh, working as expected because this was our uh, main intention and uh, our main purpose. Or another metric is the order completion time. For example, when an order arrives, normally the human operators can complete picking all the items, let's say in 10 minutes, right? If I install all the robots and then I realize that the order completion is now not 10 minutes, but five minutes, which gives me the chance to understand that I can complete the orders in a smaller time, in a shorter time. So this is another benefit. So what we are doing to ensure this, uh, or just to track these metrics, we are having longevity uh, testings. So we let the system run for a long time, and we collect all these uh, metrics. For example, on each robot, since they are always communicating to the HPC or the cloud platforms, we can already understand where they are. And if we subtract the uh, locations, each location they visit, eventually by accumulating all this information, we can reach out to the total travel distance by each robot, by tracking all the evidences and the logs sent by the robots. This is one thing. And of course, by the, analyzing the timestamps, we can understand the total time consumed for a completion or the orders. So eventually, we do some benchmarking studies. First of all, we let the system run without robots, and then we install a certain number of robots, let's say five robots, and then eventually we install 10 robots, and we collect all the performance metrics from all these versions. This is kind of A-B testing activity for the benchmarking study. In this way, we can figure out and emphasize and highlight the benefits of the system by showing the uh, collected metrics. So this is how it looks like. For example, when we observe an operation which is done in the warehouse, we can see the human operators moving around and robots also moving to different locations. And the, when they are ready, they are waiting for human operators to arrive to that uh, spot to collect or pick, uh, pick the items. Problem number two, we have lots of different hardware modules in our system. So, you know, testing hardware is different uh, and difficult. And in terms of uh, test automation, it, was, it is even further difficult. How can we simulate or uh, trigger all these kind of hardware interactions? So what we do is our solution is using the simulation environments. So for robotic system, there is the operating system designed for this uh, kind of systems, which is the ROS, 
which is robotics operating system. So based on this operating system, we develop a, a simulation environment. And in this way, we can uh, send lots of different commands and we can trigger lots of different hardware interactions. For example, even on the uh, robot, for example, there are some barcode scanner. So normally when the operator scans the barcode of the item, normally the signal is going from barcode scanner hardware to the uh, robot component. So what I can do is when I executing my test cases automatically, I can just send the message through the protocol uh, as just pretend, pretending like this message came from the real hardware system. But I can just interpret in the simulation system that just a scan operation is done uh, by the uh, barcode scanner hardware module. So this is how uh, the simulation environment looks like. We can uh, select the robots. We can uh, do a right click and send lots of different commands. And we can observe the robots uh, are already starting to move in different locations after we send these kind of commands. And uh, you can see on the right hand side, there are lots of different paths traveled by the robots uh, shown by different colors. Each robot is moving on a path and each of them we can separately show in different colors. Robot number one is traveling the distance shown with a yellow errors or the uh, yellow highlighted colors or the other robot is moving uh, in the uh, highlighted path which is shown in red color. And our next problem was the AI module. Sometimes we are using the AI component. It is very high likely to see, to see some AI components in the systems that we are developing. AI is nowadays everywhere, right? We are seeing this in the applications that we are developing. Even in the smart TV that we are watching, it is recommending some similar movies that I'm watching because it is observing all my patterns and it knows me, it learns me. And then after it learns, it is giving some predictions or uh, recommendations. So again, in our system as well, we have some AI modules, of course, as expected. So what kind of AI modules we have? For example, uh, there are some cameras installed on the robot. And when it is moving around, it recognizes, it tries to recognize some object. So it is doing a visual recognition and it is trying to do the object classification. For example, when there is an object in front of the robot when it is moving, is it a human being? Is it a live object? Or maybe just an obstacle like a box, which is uh, left on the ground uh, on the warehouse. So this kind of classification to mark this obstacle as a human being or a, just a box makes sense because if it is a, a human uh, operator, then the robot can wait a little bit because human can still move. But if it is a box, then we know that the box cannot walk. So robot uh, should not wait for uh, too much. So it just, uh, just it can move around. So this kind of uh, object classification helps us a lot to improve the efficiency in our operations. So what? how can we uh, ensure the quality of these AI modules? Of course, we are doing lots of different experiments. We are placing intentionally some obstacles in front of the robots and trying to see if they are doing the classification in the correct way or not. And next problem is the usability, because not only the functionality, but also the usability is very important in the system. Why? Because if the system is not usable, which means if the operators are struggling to use the system, they are having difficulty, they are having problems to understand what messages are shown on the screen, or where to click if they cannot find the buttons, then it means it is not uh, usable. It is not user friendly. So what happens if the operator cannot find the button to click, then it will uh, lose some time. It will be a waste of time. So in our system, efficiency is very important. It is the key performance uh, criteria, the key uh, success metric. So in terms of especially this efficiency, the usability of the system is very important. So how can we ensure the usability? We are having a lot of surveys to understand what kind of problems the users are having. We are talking to the real users, end users a lot. We are not only testing in our uh, development team because if you, do, if you are not acting as an advocate of the end user, if you are only talking to the development team, everything will look very great, right? We implemented a perfect design. 
but maybe the users or the end customers are having a lot of struggles. So it is very important not only to uh, talk to the development teams, but also communicate to the end users or the real customers as well to understand their feelings, their emotions, because testing is being an advocate of the end users. We should walk in their shoes. We should talk to them. We should get, uh, collect lots of feedback. Otherwise, maybe we will overlook some bugs or weaknesses. Maybe we will not aware of what kind of feelings they have. So in these terms, uh, communicating to the customers or the end users is very important to improve the usability of the product. And next problem. Similarly, not only the usability, along with the functionality, the resilience of the system is another great aspect of the system. What does it mean, resilience? The system is working very well, right? But for how long it will be stable? I mean, if I let the system run for a long time, it will be still stable. Or, or even if there is a problem or failure, then am I able to recover the system? It may happen. There will be some failures. There, uh, bug-free software is not possible. There are lots of different uh, bugs which may appear in lots of different environments. It is okay. These are the uh, certain risks that we can take before going production. But if this kind of happen, uh, errors or failures happen, I should be still be able to recover the system. I should somehow maybe mark the current order as a failure, and then I should be able to proceed with the next orders. But if the whole system is blocked, I am not able to proceed with the next items. There is the error, and it is blocked. The whole system is down. Then it means the system is not recoverable. It, there is some failure, but I cannot get rid of this failure in any how. But in other way around, if somehow I can get rid of this failure, for example, okay, forget about the current order. I can mark it as failure and I can go to this at the end of the day, but at least I should be proceeding with the next orders as well. So this kind of uh, abilities of the system is called as recoverability. So how can we ensure this? We are doing this chaos testing activities. What does it mean? We are intentionally letting some subsystems of the whole system down. And in this way, we are observing the other components of the system to see if they are working properly, even if some of the uh, some subsystems of the whole system is not responsive anymore, but still maybe the other components are able to recover themselves. Maybe they can just collect the current uh, uh, communication and they can uh, manage and store in the uh, their uh, memories, and when the connection to the other subsystem, which was down, is again established, they can sync later. So this kind of chaos testing activities helps a lot to ensure the resilience and the recoverability of the system. What else? There is the reproduction of the uh, issues as a challenge for us, because sometimes we are doing the test automation and we are letting them, uh, letting them run uh, automatically. Sometimes we have the nightly jobs, they are triggering overnight and they are automatically executing the test cases on the pipelines. It sounds great. It is executing automatically. It doesn't need any manual effort. But here, the challenge is, if any of the test case fails, then I should be able to understand what happened. Why the test case failed? What was the reason? What was the root cause? And sometimes it is not easy to understand because even if you collect all the evidences, you take screenshots, you can even take video when uh, you are using Selenium or any other UI automation framework, you can collect all these kind of evidences. But sometimes it is still not easy to understand why this situation uh, was uh, triggered or happened. So uh, reproducing the uh, case or the failure scenario is very important. And since the system that we are talking about is very dynamic, because sometimes there are lots of different moving objects, and we are talking about lots of different hardware modules, sometimes even the temperature or the humidity levels affects the sensors of the hardware modules and affects the system. So sometimes the exactly the same scenario is not reproducible. So what we do, uh, the solution to this problem is uh, utilizing the ROS vector. 
Rospec is a, a module developed by the official uh, ROS uh, community. And by doing this, we can replay over the collected evidences. So we can zoom into the relevant frame and we can read all the messages which were sent to the re relevant uh, components of the system. And we can even uh, replay uh, from the camera's view and we can understand what kind of obstacles uh, there was in front of the robots or what kind of other messages uh, was communicated in the system. So this raw spec replays help us a lot to understand the failed scenario and we can, in this way, we can uh, analyze and investigate the transferred messages and all the request responses, and we can do the root cause analysis in a comprehensive way. So problem number seven, the next one, is the customized requirements. What does it mean? As I told in the beginning, we have lots of different uh, warehouses and the clients. So they all have lots of different configurations. Some of them have small size warehouses. So they have only two aisles in the warehouse. So even their map is different, but some of them are bigger and they need more a uh, number of robots. So their uh, configuration are different. So we have to execute the same test cases, the same steps. For example, picking uh, three orders or three uh, items from different locations. I want to execute this test case on different platforms. But how can I do this without duplicating the test scenario? Test duplication is something that I want to avoid. I don't want to just duplicate the code just to be able to execute on different configurations. So what I do to overcome this uh, difficulty is I exclude the configurational uh, parameters or the environmental variables from the test code itself. I manage all these configuration files separately from the test code. So the same test code which is performing the steps can be executed with uh, different configurational variables. So this will help me a lot to improve the reusability of the test cases and removing the duplication. And the next problem is the domain knowledge. It is a different domain. When I first joined to this project, I did nothing about the warehouses. They are talking about some different terminology. They are saying tote. What does a tote mean? I don't understand. I don't know what it means. Or they are talking about the uh, waiting or uh, idle positions, or what should be the priority of the orders, which order should be uh, processed first. This kind of uh, knowledge is specific on the domain. So to be able to understand this, again, we can uh, visit the warehouses and we can understand their customized flows. For example, some warehouses have some printers in the warehouses. So whenever some uh, orders arrive, they just print the order and they just distribute to the human operators. So these kind of custom behaviors and the warehouse specific flows to be able to aware of these kind of scenarios, we should visit the warehouses and we should understand what kind of use cases the operators are performing. Otherwise, if we do not do that, maybe we will overlook some scenarios and our test coverage will be enough to catch the bugs or the weaknesses on these kind of specific scenarios. And one similar problem is the technical stack because we are talking about sending some messages on some specific protocols. We are talking about some doing comprehensive root cause analysis, all this kind of stuff, like uh, using the uh, robotic operating system, simulations, lots of different things is not easy to adapt. So whenever we are doing some new hirings, there are some newcomers to the team. There is an adaptation process. And there is a learning curve. So to reduce this learning curve, what we do is we do lots of different onboarding documentation. Sometimes we do the uh, meetings and record these meetings, and we can create lots of different documentations like Confluence Spaces or any other documentation tools we use. And eventually, whenever a new jo uh, member joins to the team, then we share all the documentation we have, and we send him or her to the customers to visit to understand what kind of use scenarios are performed in the real production environment. In this way, we are trying to reduce the learning curve for the uh, members or the teammates which were recently joined to the project or the team. And finally, uh, problem number 10. This is the last but not least one, the maintenance of the test automation. This is not specific to only this project, but it is applicable to any project. If we are doing the test automation, we should continuously maintain the test implementation. 
because it is not working like this. I implement one test code. Okay, I'm done. I can go to the home and I can have a good rest because I already uh, complete my test execution. No, sometimes the behaviors are changing. They are updating because we are working in agile practices. Agile is welcoming the changes. So the users can request some additional features or uh, some behavior changes. So accordingly, we should update our test cases, test scenarios, or even without, regardless of the behavior changes, sometimes they change the UI layouts. So sometimes you will realize your test case is broken. Why? Because the locator is not working anymore. They change the paths of the elements on the page. So we should maintain these kind of uh, test improvement points and we should fix or update our test cases. So the maintenance efforts we should optimize in a way. So let me share how we did on the test code itself. I showed this slide in the very, uh, very beginning of the presentation, but I want to show it again now by highlighting some key points. First of all, I am using the test configs, or which can be called as annotation or test tags, to be able to map the implementation with the test scenario. So I have some IDs here. So if I go to my test management tool, I can read the test steps over there and I can uh, align with the test implementation. This is the first uh, key feature that I'm using. The next thing, you are not uh, seeing any particular step, but all of them, the common steps are collected in some separate classes, which we call as helper class. So in this way, I'm removing the duplication. I'm not always, for example, I have a login step, right? So I'm doing the login in all the test cases. So if I have already the login helper and I'm doing the steps in the helper class, then I don't uh, have to uh, duplicate or repeat these login steps in all the test cases. Just call the relevant class, that's all. And if I have to update, then I go to relevant class and maintain only one class rather than lots of different test cases. And you don't see any locator or selector on this class, right? Because we just discussed, if the developers change the layout of the page, they will be broken. So what do we do? Again, similarly, we collect all the locators in a specific class. This is how we call, as most of the test automation engineers are very uh, well, uh, uh, do very well know, which is the page object model. Uh, so in this way, we try to improve the maintainability of the locators. And eventually, you don't see any specific dummy weights, like wait for five seconds, wait for 10 seconds. No, we utilize some smart weights. So if we are waiting for any specific condition, then just wait until the condition is met. Why are you waiting for 15 seconds? Maybe it is already met in five seconds. So we don't have to lose 10 more seconds. So these kind of best practices we try to utilize in our test automation framework. So I'm just wrapping up. We went through lots of different problems, not only the problems, but also some proposals as well. They were, first of all, the testability, the purpose, the benefits of the system. To highlight this, we are doing some A-B testing activities, longevity and performance testing activities. And then we have the some hardware testing uh, activities. For this, we are utilizing the simulation environments. And we have AI components. We are doing lots of different experiments to understand if they are working properly. And uh, not only the functionality, but also usability and the resilience or the recoverability of the system. So we are using the, uh, uh, the customer uh, surveys, user communications, and chaos testing activities. And we have the reproduction of bugs problem. So for this purpose, we were using raw spec to replay the scenarios and to do the comprehensive root cause analysis. And we have the customization of warehouses. So for this uh, case, we are excluding the configurational variables from the test code itself. So we are trying to make our test automation framework as flexible as possible. And we are trying to make our uh, test reusable. And we have the domain specific knowledge, uh, know-how, so for this purpose, we are using the warehouse visits and to reduce the learning curve of the new joiners in the team uh, to improve the technical stack, we are using lots of different onboarding documentations, including the recorded meetings and eventually the maintenance of the test cases, 
we are doing static and dynamic uh, code analysis. Like uh, for static, we can use lots of different tools. And for dynamic code analysis, we can utilize the peer reviews and do the uh, code reviews uh, in an efficient way. So last thing, last but not least, it is a call for action. So my advice for everyone is, first of all, define your problems. And then collaborate with different teams to achieve, uh, to cope with these kind of problems. Because you, individually, you will not be able to solve all the problems. But you work with different, if you work with different teams and uh, collaborations, then you will be achieving the teamwork and the holistic approach. So for this purpose, share and communicate to lots of different people and do not hesitate to try. Fail first, but eventually you will achieve all the quality targets. So thanks for uh, listening to me. And uh, I think there will be a discussion session. I will be more than glad to answer uh, your questions. Thank you, Mesut, for such great talk. Uh, we have several questions. Uh, so okay. uh, Alexander is asking uh, how about, um, yes, we, uh, we have, um, uh, may, uh, ah, okay, so uh, we don't have time. We are going to discussion zone. Uh, sure. And uh, then we can uh, talk about uh, such questions in discussion zone. Okay, cool.